made for the first time in ages baked oats, which is our favourite brekkie. And then, I don't know why Tom told me it because I actually did make it. I'll link the recipe down below. I just got it out. You did. Would you like a steaming hot bowl? Please, with coconut yogurt. Um, how much of it do you want? Um, yeah, we made baked oats for breakfast because we don't have any bread and I hate eating porridge on the weekends. Does anyone else have those like weird rules about food? I don't know, porridge is like a practical, sensible breakfast I eat in the weekday so I don't get hungry while I'm working. Um, but I don't like eating on the weekends. <laughs> I like eating something fun. Um, but we had fry up yesterday. So anyway, we thought we'd make big baked oats. We made it loads last, like the November lockdown last year when we were in Brighton. And I literally haven't made it since, but I love it. It's just like, kind of like crumble, it tastes like. But for breakfast, it's just like oats, baking powder, um, milk, fruit, sugar, cinnamon. And then we put an egg in it, but you can put like a flax egg if that's preferred. And it's actually really filling. You have it with yogurt. Um, or you can like eat it as a dessert with custard and that's also really good. Anyway, I'm hanging out on the sofa this morning. It's so dark. We like wanted to get up early and go out, but it, we woke up at like 7.30 and it was like pitch black and we were like, that's a bit, bit much to go out that early. So we're in breakfast and we're going to get changed and then we're going to head to Zamfort, I think, which is the beach on the coast just because I really want to see the sea. I know I'm going back to England and I can see the sea a lot easier soon, but I don't know, I've just got this like pull inside of me. I'm not going to swim because um, we're getting public transport there and it's like minus one. So I could like physically swim. I would be able to get in the cold water, but I don't think the aftermath would be very pretty. It's not like we're just like popping home afterwards because we have to get the train. But yeah, we thought it would be quiet as well because it's Santa Claus this weekend. I don't actually know what they call it, but it's like Dutch Christmas, which obviously we don't have anyone to celebrate that with. So we were due to have family here, but um, we obviously cancelled for various reasons. So we're going to, yeah, go to the beach, get a coffee there, hang out, come back, and then probably um, I'm going to pre film some more Vlogmas, like sit down videos, and then we're going to watch the Qatar Grand Prix. The penultimate Grand Prix of the season, which we're very excited about. And even more excited because I think we'll be back in England for the final Grand Prix, which means we can watch it on my mum's obnoxiously large TV, which is better than watching it on the iPad. So that's exciting. Um, I will catch up with you when I'm out of my dressing gown and into my clothes. Oh, I'm almost finished with... My body keeps your secrets and now it's annoying because I think it's one of my favourite books of the year but like I don't know where to put it in my rankings because I've already organised my favourite books of the year. Um, It's like particularly the last third I would recommend. Um, I like the rest of it. There's a lot on like sexual assault and trauma. I've read a lot of books about that this year so maybe it's not as impactful but the stories are really well written. The tone is really colloquial way more than I thought so. Um, They read almost like essays but the final th like quarter of the book is about specifically about a chronic illness and um even more specifically about endometriosis but it's like the most compelling writing I've read on endo in a really long time I've started and like dnf so many of the like endo books that are like my endo guide or my um there's like loads of different ones basically that you'll know if you search like book about endo yum um you'll get but I find them it's not that they're not useful and I'm like really glad that they exist and I feel like they help a lot of people but because I've already done a lot of reading and have unfortunately slash fortunately um close people in my life who live with endo that I feel like they cover things that I already know about or experiences I've already gone through like because I spent 10 years undiagnosed and didn't know what endo was then I got a diagnosis eventually and my surgery came quite quickly after that. So I didn't really spend a lot of time reading about it. And then lots of the books are talking about like building up to your surgery, what you need to do, what you need to bring, da, da, da. And now I feel like also because I was a old hand at illness by the time I got my endo diagnosis, that I didn't feel like a lot of the information was like talking to people who are newly chronically ill. 
And because I'd already lived with chronic illness for four years before I got an endo diagnosis, I felt like a lot of the information about like being medically gaslit or um, accessing services and stuff was like stuff I'd already been through. So I don't know. I'm like really glad those books exist for people, particularly if endo is like your, your only diagnosis or something you're like newly discovering. But um, yeah, I feel like this book particularly talks about endo in a way that I find really relatable and like absolutely fucking harrowing, like talking about the side effects and like infertility and actually it's the first piece of writing I've read on these like um I don't know what the hell, what the um prefix is it's like GR uh, basically these injections that I'm considering that put your body into like temporary menopause um and Lucia the author of the book has done them and talked about them and talked about the experiences that other people have had because they are quite like a dangerous not dangerous in the fact you'll die, but dangerous in the fact that every time you stop your cycle, there's a chance it won't reboot and you could then be permanently in menopause age 25, which is fine. Some people opt for that. There's a lot of discussion about fertility and like hysterectomies and those kind of conversations, which are all things I think about, but I don't really have anyone to talk about, particularly like non-sick friends talking about fertility with like your friends who are your own age, who maybe you know want children or like don't really think about how complicated it might be to have a child. So yeah, I really appreciate Lucia's wise words on that. Anyway, that's the book ramble. I'm going to start a new fiction book on the train as well. So I will share that with you. New angle. You are on my, um, where we dry our clothes. Anyway, just got ready. Thought I'd show you my outfit because I feel cute for the first time in ages. Uh, ignore the roots. We don't know what we're doing about that. Headband is and other stories, jewelry is the usual Anna Luisa. Um my favourite jumper in the world. Which I got our car boot sale maybe four years ago in the middle of summer and I was like with my friend I was like, I don't really need it and she was like, You'll regret it. And I would have because it's the best four pounds I've ever spent. I get so many compliments on it and it looks like independent design and knitwear that costs like three hundred pounds. So God bless my yin yang jumper bought from a lovely hippie lady at car boot sale. This um, gilet is also old from Beyond Retro in Brighton. It's just like a shirling one. Also got it a few years ago, now very much on trend. Then I'm wearing a new, this is actually a dress, a slip dress. Don't mind my heat tech thermals underneath. I uh, got this on Depop recently. I wanted more silky skirts and stuff, but um, I think the skirt I found quite unflattering on my stomach so I got dresses instead that I can just like layer as skirts because I'm never gonna wear like a skirt and a crop top kind of thing like I just want them mostly for the winter to be honest um, with jumpers and in the spring so yeah I got this on Depop it's Topshop um, it's too big for me but that's how I like my clothes and it was like a tenner so yeah this is like a silk midi dress and then I'm wearing it with my cowboy boots for like a very brown beigey outfit and you may be thinking Hannah it's minus one why are you wearing like not wearing trousers but I have my heat tech leggings on underneath which seems like a crime because it's like I'm wearing leggings in a dress but obviously they look like tights and I was gonna put tights over the top and then I was like what would be the point in that so anyway this is the fit and I'm just gonna take my tiny black side bag and force Tom to carry my book because I don't want to carry a handbag. Um, I think I'm going to be warm enough. I've got my thermos on, but I'm going to ask Tom to check the weather. And maybe I will also um, wear a jacket. I also did my makeup, but I did not put any mascara on because fuck taking off mascara, like it's so much effort. But I did very glowy skin with my usual milk makeup. So this is the vibe. Let's go to the beach. First, let's get coffee at Starbucks and then let's go to the beach. In the winter, I become such a Starbucks hoe. Like normally I'm all for independence, supporting my local, but sometimes when you want that sweet sugary Christmas goodness, you just gotta go to Starbucks. Particularly like our local coffee shops don't do any special flavors and stuff. So you gotta do what you gotta do. And also nowhere's accepting reusable cups at the moment still. So such is the life to get that Starbucks red cup. Anyway, let's go to the train station, get Starbucks, go to the beach. You can see the train. Now, are you walking very close to that? It's not too far. 
too windy here though. I know, but the beach is always windy. Yeah. <gasps> oh, I feel so happy. Yeah, so now. Guys, we made it to the beach and I'm so happy. It's so beautiful. I feel like I'm at home, like in Dorset or somewhere one of my friends lives uh, near Stadlam Bay and this reminds me of that. I'm just so chuffed. I said to Tom next time I tell you I'm really depressed, remind me to come to the beach because something about the beach in the winter is also just so gorgeous. It's really sandy here. No one's swimming, a few surfers, but Lots of dogs, so many dogs, right? Heckin dogs. So people are playing football. We don't know if it's like a Christmas thing, but there's lots of people out and about. Like in England, the beach is busy on Christmas day. So people are doing their family walks or if this is what it's always like on a Sunday. But it is gorgeous. There's so much space, so much air. Very COVID friendly. Yeah, it's a very COVID friendly. And an Omicron Christmas. Um, but it's actually gorgeous and I just feel Elated to be here, I shall tell you that. Although Tom did say, I don't know if you can see, there's an oil rig out there quite near, which we thought was interesting. And there's huge plumes, 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 um, fumes of smoke coming off, which we're going to go see what that's about, because it looks like they're doing a lot of stuff. If I didn't say we're at Zamforth, which if you are a duchy or you come to the Netherlands, then it's where the Grand Prix actually is and we've only ever been to you see we are back at home I'm under the sofa duvet which is different to the bed duvet Tom's catching up on the women's FA Cup and I'm very cold right now but I had such a nice day which feels like a miracle although we had a nice day on Friday but yeah just felt very cooped up recently for obvious reasons but it felt really good to go out on the way back from Zamforth. We stopped in Harlem, which we've never been to before. It's like a small town, a smallish town. Um, like those people who move out from Amsterdam, move to Harlem. It's really cool. Would defo live there. Um, and we went for a really good lunch, walked around a bit. I just picked up. Let me see two big candles to burn they're not scented but just because we really like lighting them in the morning when it's so dark at like eight o'clock my eyebrows look really dark speaking of that um but i've been reading on the train ghost forest which is so cute can you see how tiny it is look at it next to my hand it's like a really small book um published by one world i bought this on a whim when i was ordering stuff we needed for our switch and it was like 12 euros and I was like, oh, I'm going to buy it. Um, and I've read maybe a quarter and I'm loving it. So it's, I don't think it is translated, but it's a piece of um, fiction talking about the migration experience from Hong Kong to Canada. Sorry about that shadow. And um, we follow one family, a teenage girl and her experiences basically flitting between the two it's told in these little vignettes 
and it's really beautiful and each chapter it's like every chapter is like a page or a page and a half which is perfect for me right now um and it's all about having an astronaut dad so that which was a hong kong phrase that was like mainstreamed in the 90s after basically there was like a huge migration out of hong kong when just before the 1993 handover from britain to china because a lot of hong Kongese people weren't sure what that meant um to lose their like hong kong citizenship or to become um under chinese rule um so a lot of people left and they migrated to america to canada to england but a lot of the fathers stayed behind because they had really good jobs particularly the second wave of people who the families who wanted to leave because they arrived in these cities and obviously realized they were xenophobic and um they weren't taking into account their qualifications so people who were managers or and businessmen ended up in dishwashing or factory working and like weren't able to make as much money as they had in Hong Kong. So the dads ended up for a lot of the time staying behind. And it's this idea of like an astronaut father who like comes and goes from space, which is I think a really like beautiful phrase. So it opens with the death of her dad in Hong Kong. And then we trace back through her teenage years right from when she was born and her a lot of like intergenerational stuff her grandma um her grandparents moved with them initially to um Canada to Vancouver and then they also moved back and forth but you hear from so like an opening chapter might say my grandma says and then it will be um a couple of pages from the point of view of the grandma talking about their childhood or their experience back in Hong Kong which is really beautifully written um, and yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. I know a lot of people have probably read this, um, although I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's a US publication, so I don't know if it's out, like where you can source it. But yeah, like I said, I got it online. So yeah, really enjoying that. Um, I think I'll probably finish it like tomorrow. And yeah, just going to have a cosy afternoon at home, watch the Grand Prix and eat leftovers for dinner. But can now Esteban Ocon hang on to Valtteri Bottas and come home and complete that podium trio? He's got a little bit of DRS assistance with Yuki Simona just ahead of him to help. Morning, happy Monday. I'm just coming at you to fill you in on the book that I just finished. I think this will be the last clip in this vlog because you guys seem to like often like small vlogs more often for vlogmas so that's cool um i just finished last night um well i started and finished yesterday ghost forest by pic shram fung i absolutely loved this at its core it's just a beautiful meditation on dying it's like very explicit in the content around death which depending on where you are in your life if you're on a grief journey if you um find it hard to read about people dying then obviously this won't be for you but I think it's um yeah just such a beautiful oh I put the dust jacket off and I put it back on upside down <laughs> um I just think it's so beautiful on yeah relationships father-daughter relationships and it um each chapter towards the end is basically a day in the hospital of um the family with their father who's passing away it's a lot on like disparate relationships um particularly like within that context of migration and um that experience of like missing out on someone while they're healthy or um not being able to build a solid like adult relationship with a parent which I thought was really beautiful um yeah I just really enjoyed it I'm tempted to put it in my books of the year but I get nervous putting books this late in the year into my books of the year because I feel like there's a bit of bias like recency bias that I've read it you know just now so do I love it more but then I've also been thinking a lot recently I was like chatting to a couple of friends with this how I think that the idea of like memorable books and um a critique that's often levied at fiction is that like it's I didn't like it that much because it hasn't stuck with me or I haven't remembered it um and I don't think that that for me personally is that useful of a critique because I think it's so much about the like subjectivity the time and space that you read a book in whether or not it sticks with you whether or not the content was really harrowing so it's not always going to stay in your mind because that would be like a hard thing to cope with all the time if that makes sense 
I was thinking about making a video where I like, um, my friend Jay did a video where he responded to one star reviews of his favorite books. I think I might do that and then, but like pull out some of the reviewing tropes that I really hate. And one of them is like, this book isn't memorable. So yeah, let me know if you'd be interested in me just being a bitch basically about other people's reviews. <laughs> no, obviously would keep it a non like Goodreads reviews. But anyway, I really adored this and it's tiny form. If you're into vignettes, fragmentary writing, stories on death, stories on grief, this is an underrated read. I think you might enjoy. So with that being said, I'm going to, as you can see, I'm in a pile of pillows today, doing some medical admin, trying to see if I can organise some appointments for when I get back to England, just like general therapy, uh, like, what do you call it, complementary therapy stuff, osteopaths and parent technique and stuff like that, not necessarily like full-blown medical appointments, because I don't think I want pre-Christmas medical trauma in my life but yeah that's what we're up to today and i'll catch up with you on a new vlog tomorrow